66 million years ago, dinosaurs disappeared from the fossil record in a mysterious event called the End Cretaceous Extinction, or KT, the fifth mass extinction event in the history of the Earth. In 1980, a father-son pair of scientists named Alvarez examined the rock from the time of the extinction. They discovered that this layer, known as the KT boundary, contained extraordinary concentrations of iridium, a heavy metal common in space rocks but rare on the surface of the Earth, with the exception of trace amounts that sprinkle down as space rocks burn through the atmosphere. They hypothesized that so much iridium could only have come from an asteroid, so large that it would have been catastrophic for life. In the following years, the massive Chicxulub crater in the Gulf of Mexico was determined to be about the same age as the iridium layer, and the impact theory of extinction went viral. It was a brilliant theory, but an incomplete story as it failed to account for some of the largest supervolcanoes in Earth history, which went off at exactly the same time. It was always a theory that was mostly promoted by the media. There were so many people involved that they could suppress anything else that was not supporting it. It's run its course. Gerda Keller is a Princeton University paleontologist and the most prominent researcher arguing that dinosaurs died by volcanoes, though she's known for being a contrarian. Her interest in mass extinction is existential. I wanted to know why there were mass extinctions and how they came about and whether we were lurching into another one. Gerda has literally escaped extinction. At one point, she was caught in a bank robbery and took a bullet. From about this distance, I thought, shit, this is bad. <laughs> Though many in the scientific community are quick to dismiss Gerda and her theories, there is no debate that extraordinary volcanic activity happened at the time of the KT. It left behind a very conspicuous footprint, a two-mile-thick formation of volcanic rock covering an area the size of France in modern-day India. These rocky formations are known as the Deccan Traps, and you can recognize them throughout the Indian landscape, primarily from their distinctive layers, each formed from the cooling of molten lava. Just one layer after another a layer cake, and each time is one giant eruption. It's incredible. The impact folks simply ignored anything about Deccan, never addressed it, until 2013, I think a few more years, and it will be obvious. But between the two modes of disaster, there is a finer point about the nature of mass extinction. While the impact theory is often oversimplified to be understood as an instantaneous catastrophe, vaporizing dinosaurs, an extinction by volcano would occur gradually, over tens or hundreds of thousands of years, slowly enough that one could spend their entire life living through a mass extinction and never even notice. Deccan Traps gives you 25,000 years of hyperthermal warming. It gets really hot. The most deadly part is that it turns into acid rain on land and ocean acidification. That's really the real cause of practically every one of the big mass extinctions. All four of the mass extinctions prior to the KT are believed to have been caused at least partially by volcanoes, specifically three airborne pollutants, sulfur dioxide, which causes acid rain and global cooling, lasting about 10 years, carbon dioxide, which causes ocean acidification and global warming, lasting about 1,000 years, and toxic smoke, distributing heavy metals, especially mercury, all over the world. Human civilization has never witnessed a volcano large enough to cause a mass extinction, the most destructive volcano we've recorded was Mount Tambora in 1815, which caused global climate disruptions so severe that 1816 was dubbed the year without summer, as winter weather during the summer caused famines throughout the world. And this was thousands of times smaller than the Deccan, which erupted routinely for hundreds of thousands of years. When you want to look at what causes the mass extinction, you want to look at the base of the food chain because everything else is going to feed off that. So it's the microfossils, 
if you affect the base, it's going to have cascading effects to all the other trophic levels that depend on these organisms for food. Hi, I'm Janvi Punekar. I work on micropaleontology, which is the study of microscopic fossils. And I use these to reconstruct paleo environments and understand about how the oceans were millions of years ago. We study these small marine planktonic bugs with calcium carbonate shells. That's the record in which we interpret the possibility of ocean acidification. The fossil record of a microscopic plankton called Foraminifera offer insight as to what happened during the extinction. Their fossil record is fantastically well preserved thanks to their tiny shells, which accumulate on the ocean floor and fossilize with exceptional reliability. If you study dinosaurs, you're not gonna have a group of 20 dinosaurs entirely preserved anywhere. But when we study forams, you can get hundreds of them in the sediment. So we can do population analysis. That's how we also identify the extinction. There is a diversity drop. Through the extinction, the fossil record of foraminifera collapses from over 60 species to just one. There's only one survivor. It's a, what I call a disaster opportunist. Because it's still around today. You can't kill this bugger. And their demise follows a pattern, taking out the largest ones first. Some species start showing the decrease in their average size. We call it dwarfing. What is critical is just before the extinctions, we see extremely poor preservation. They don't look good and well-preserved. They don't look shiny and nice. They're broken and they look like they've been dissolved. Why are dissolved shells evidence of volcanic activity? The answer lies in a chemical solution you probably call seltzer water, created when water dissolves carbon dioxide from the air. Most people don't know it, but seltzer is acidic, and this is the reason that carbonated beverages erode your teeth. So if you pump in more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, that's eventually going to make the waters acidic. Acid completely dissolves shells. In order to grow, shelled organisms need the basic conditions of seawater, around pH 8.3. Seawater doesn't need to dissolve enough CO2 to become fizzy. Tiny increases will make it harder for shelled organisms to grow. If the waters get acidic, these organisms that need to secrete calcium carbonate shells are unable to get the building blocks of the shells. It exposes them to the environmental extremities around them. They become more vulnerable. And if you hold these stress conditions for long enough, they might go extinct, which is exactly what we see. The final 50,000, 40,000 years before the KT is when things get really, really bad. Excess carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for up to 1,000 years after its introduction. But the ocean acidification leading up to the KT appears to last perhaps 50 times longer. This would require a continuous source of carbon dioxide. And these researchers think that emissions from a single asteroid impact probably wouldn't last long enough. Regular volcanic eruptions make a lot more sense. But what makes the researchers confident that volcanoes erupted at the same time the oceans were acidifying? Mercury. Anomalous amounts of mercury have been found in sediments. Each major eruption event shows a peak in the mercury concentration in the sediment record. And by matching these peaks with the changes in the climate is how we link Deccan to the climate change. What caused the KT extinction is a highly contentious topic. The controversy comes from having two major triggers. It's really difficult to tease out what caused how much damage. Analyzing the chemical signatures of 66 million year old rocks and fossils is imprecise. Even if the dating methods are accurate within 1%, their estimates could still be off by 600,000 years. And in many places, the soil from the KT has long since washed away. Making sense of so much data from all over the world is overwhelming, and it doesn't all line up. Interpretation is up to the researchers. Some of them think that the impact was so powerful that it set off the Deccan, a spectacular theory of maximum destruction. But as seen in the layers of volcanic rock, the Deccan erupted not once, but over and over, suggesting that the timing was coincidental. We do know for sure that volcanism started way before the impact. In January 2020, a new study with 37 authors argued that most of the Deccan's deadly gases came 200,000 years too early to have caused the mass extinction. They believe it was the impact. In reality, this debate will probably never end. It is not possible to prove what happened. 
nobody really knows. But the scientific community does tend to agree on something else. If you look at the data of the number of species that are going extinct every year, they are comparable or probably even worse than the previous. If a mass extinction caused by humans gives you anxiety, you can relax. It's been going on since well before your lifetime, probably since before humans could build cities or even grow our own food. Back to when we were just really organized hunters. It's important to keep in mind, mass extinctions do not mean that everything goes extinct. There are plenty of species that continue to live. If you want to learn about all six mass extinctions, we recommend a book called The Ends of the World. You can also buy merchandise at astroltd.com. You can find a link in the video description below.